We have about 105 people who follow us on YouTube. And one of the most recent members is Professor Steve Parker, who is at Flinders University in South Australia, near Adelaide, which means he's the fourth member of our class from Adelaide. There would be Steve, and then there's my wife, Bronwyn, and then there is Bernard, Bernard Brandstater, there you are, and William Johnson. So four very good members of our Sabbath school from Adelaide, South Australia. It's a hot bed. Yes. <laughs> um, notice they're all here rather than there. That's an interesting thing, too. We also have a very special friend of Roy Branson's. That is Dr. Herbert Bloomstead. We typically don't single people out in our audience because we think they deserve privacy. But um, Roy said he had no better friend than Dr. Bloomstead. And he spoke often of riding across the country when he was much younger. And Dr. Bloomstead somehow was riding with them. And Roy was trying to learn as much about serious music as he could as they drove across. So, oh, we have mixed feelings when we come here. On the one hand, we are happy for all the years we had with Roy, and on the other hand, uh, we miss him a great deal. David Trim spoke to us this morning from the Philippines. He is watching what we are doing, and he is watching what you're doing, Gil, and what you're doing, Ron. And he, uh, he's going to be it's going to be important that you please him on this. I, I had the idea that I shared with David this morning of maybe we could put on this screen parts or holes of the papers they presented back east in the Situated Adventism Conference. That way we could see the people presenting their papers and then we could discuss them. And with a little, with a little luck, we could bring in the authors of those papers by way of Zoom conferencing calls, so we would have their papers and we would be able to discuss them with them. So that's in the future. We are going to go live on YouTube very shortly, and that will be good too. So let's pause. Oh, I should say, our two speakers are Ron Graybill, Adventist historian, who taught much at La Sierra University, has published a lot on the writings of Ellen White and on her work with race relations in particular. Gilbert Valentine, also a historian, really knows the life of Ellen White and those who are close to her very well. They were both at this conference, and they both heard uh, Nicholas Miller's paper on Adventism, Fundamentalism, and the Bible, and they have their own reaction to it. I think they are going to say something like this. I think that Adventists are not fundamentalists theoretically, but they are functionally. But I bet it's the other way too. I think there are lots of Adventists who are theoretically fundamentalists, but not functionally so. I think it works both ways. So let's pause for prayer. Dear God, thank you for this class. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for Roy, who got us started and whose legacy we wish to continue. We wish to be aware of your presence in our midst as we think carefully about how you have communicated with people all through the centuries. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, Gil and I, we meet regularly. Every week we meet to try and inspire a new appreciation for Ellen White and our history. You, Some of you remember the movie uh, the Dead Poets Society, uh, where the teacher was trying to get these students to appreciate poets that they thought were dead and gone. Well, we don't think the prophets are dead and gone, and so we have the Dead Prophets Society, and we're going to uh, gain a new appreciation. So I've titled our, our presentation, Our Adventist Functional Fundamentalists, and I think, uh, I think we're right that some are and some aren't. But anyway, I think the early slides, um, I think our friend Gil is going to comment on. 
We heard this gentleman last week. He was here. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, uh, Professor Nicholas Miller was with us, um, sharing in a summary form his idea about uh, Adventists not really being fundamentalists. Um, this was a paper that he presented at the conference back in January, and it was. It's also really the substance of an article that he's recently written for the Oxford Oxford Handbook of the Bible in America. It's got some fascinating articles in that new book, just published late 2017. Um, one on Mormonism and the Bible, and the one on Adventism and the Bible is presented by this, this gentleman. He makes the argument, and he did to us, and it was such an argument that it hit banner headlines in the Review and Herald um, at the time that the conference was being convened. Adventists are not fundamentalists. And a headline in the review. And the point of his argument was this. While fundamentalists have usually defended the verbal inerrancy of Scripture, that is, that the Bible lacks error in every way and all matters, Seventh-day Adventists, for the most part, have not had that kind of attitude. We take a high view of Scripture, but we do not believe in verbal inerrancy of it. And the same applies to Ellen White. He, he gives two or three other reasons that he thinks Adventists are not fundamentalists um, about the trajectory, the, the goodness of God that provides a, an interpretive framework that others didn't have, um, the fact that we, re, we do consider science, nature's book, as providing some revelation, but I'm sure there are many fundamentalists who, who also have that perspective. Um, so there are three other reasons, but the one that causes some problems for us, I think, is, is this one, that Adventists really, in my perspective, are fundamentalists, and fundamentalists somewhat in their DNA. In that we wouldn't be where we are, were, <laughs> with regard to our interpretation of doctrine, our understanding of the prophecies from a historicist perspective, unless we really believed that scripture was infallible, without error, and that it was verbally inspired. We could rely on the words of Scripture, the specific words from Leviticus 16 and Daniel 8, 14, and Revelation that talks about the Testament. So um, I disagree with Nicholas on that, but I do agree with him <laughs> in that Adventists need to move beyond fundamentalism and that fundamentalism is not an adequate framework for understanding Scripture or Ellen White. And so, really, I do agree with, with uh, Professor Nicholas, but how he gets there, I'm, I'm in disagreement. And I'd like to share with you some of the background why I think we're not reading history correctly, as he suggests here. The, the terms that we use, inerrant, infallible, plenary, inspired, and the issue of does inspiration apply to the words of Scripture or to the thoughts of Scripture? And is that really, eventually, a non-issue? Um, so, 1883 is the first major statement that the church made about its understanding of what inspiration is. The word theopneustia, God breathed. Scripture is God breathed. But how do we understand that in practice is the, the real issue that we've struggled with. We believe, said the General Conference, as they approached the task of having to make some changes in the testimony, Commas in the wrong place, poor grammar, maybe an idea that wasn't expressed really well and that needed a change. So we adopted the framework that we understand that the enlightenment is of, of the mind, thus imparting the thoughts and not, except in rare cases, the very words in which the ideas should be expressed. That was how we understood inspiration. But then we went on and said, in the republication of the testimonies, verbal changes can be made so as to remove the above-named imperfections as far as possible without in any measure changing the thought. And there's the rub. Because while we were comfortable changing the word, the question is, can you change a word without really changing the thought? Because thoughts are expressed in words. This was 1883, and around Adventism, there was a major debate going on. 
Hodge and Warfield and others were pushing back against some English theologian who had suggested that we should understand inspiration in degrees. And there were four degrees that had been suggested. So when Butler introduced that idea to Adventism, he wasn't introducing something new. It was already being debated. And around Adventism, there was a major debate as to whether inspiration was something manifested in the words or just in the thoughts. The book that was the standard book for Adventists was, had been written by Moses Hull, um, The Bible from Heaven. And it was circulated widely and advertised and it advocated an infallible and an inerrant Bible. And that was standard fare for <coughs> Adventist consumption. Moses Hull didn't last long in the church. <laughs> Um, he, he fell out, um, became a spiritualist. But Dudley Kenwright picked up his book and reissued it, rewrote it, add some, added some material. It was really kind of our first example, I guess, of plagiarism, because this book is the direct plagiarism of, of Moses Hull's. And of course, Moses Hull tells us that his is a plagiarism of, of many other sources. So they weren't. Um, careful about acknowledging sources, except when they quoted in the back of the book some important things. But here's what these men said. Nothing in the Bible contradicts any of the sciences of physiology, anatomy, hygiene, material medicine, chemistry, astronomy, astronomy, or geology. You can rely on scripture as being authoritative for all of those fields. No mistakes at all. So the question is, are we fundamentalist or not? When that is really part of our DNA and part of our background. Um, so here are some contemporary answers to the question. We were, but realised we couldn't be, and changed in 1883. That's the statement we just read. But when we changed, did we really change? Did we solve the problem by simply saying it's in the thoughts, not in the words? We departed from what we should have been. And then we need to return. So that's the movement of the 1920s. We've wandered away, we need to go back. And what <coughs> Dr. Nicholas says, we never were to begin with. That's what we disputed this morning. We are, but we don't want to be. <laughs> and maybe we should add another one. We were, and maybe are, but cannot afford to be when we deal with the facts and the information. Um, just before we get to this, Ron, uh, and, and you can talk about that one, because uh, I've talked too much already, but this book <laughs> by Galson, Louis Galson, takes really the same perspective. This is the book entitled Theopneustia, um, and maybe we should wait until after the next slide before I talk about it. I've got, I've got his picture coming up. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. We'll leave that till, oh. till a little bit later. Okay. Um, we're, we're working out this uh, tandem show. You know. <laughs> in, the, in 1915, of course, Prescott had been involved in the uh, revision of the Great Controversy in 1911 and 1912, for which he'd already suffered a lot of criticism. So in 1915, he wrote this letter to Willie White. And in it, he said, large responsibility rests upon those of us who know that there are serious errors in our authorized books and yet make no effort to correct them. I think he's talking about Bible readings and some of the other things. Um, it appears to me that there is so much more anxiety, there is much more anxiety to prevent a possible shock to some trustful people than to correct error. The way your mother's writings have been handled and the false impression concerning them which is still fostered among the people have brought great, great perplexity and trial to me. Now notice he, notice this uh, note he puts on the bottom. I have written this myself, and I did not wish to dictate it to anyone. Not even his secretary. And it didn't come to light until Desmond Ford was doing research for his defense at Glacier View. 1980. And uh, he thought it was a blockbuster which it didn't prove to be, but at any rate, that was Prescott's, uh, that was Prescott's uh, position. Now, what happened once Desmond Ford found it and it became known? What happened, Gil? 
Yeah, the, the letter became widely um, circulated because, in fact, it was very enlightening. Um, and in order to push back against the letter, Arthur White developed a, a fairly major response, blaming the problem on Prescott himself. Prescott, in 1915, was the one who raised the problem. Well, Arthur White suggested that Prescott was really the one who was at the problem because he'd introduced to the church the very fundamentalist, conservative theology of Galson, Louis Galson, plenary inspiration. So Arthur White said, don't let the letter trouble you too much. Um, Prescott didn't really understand fully what was going on and he introduced the problem of fundamentalism to the church anyway. Well, I had read enough on Prescott by that time to know that the problem of fundamentalism and in an errant Bible pre predated Prescott by quite a margin. Um, and so I wrote a response to Arthur White's um, article and... He was going to say diatribe. <laughs> and he explained a much broader background and, and Arthur White eventually conceded that he hadn't done sufficient homework to be able to make the case. But you can find that article now in, in Catalyst magazine. And this is the website address for Catalyst magazine and in that issue you have uh, uh, Gill's article. Now, in one of the things that Arthur White said, which supports our point that we're making this morning, in his paper, is the white estate leaders, this is in response to, sort of a response to the the white estate leaders have found the concept of verbal inspiration so embedded in the minds and hearts of the folk, of our folk, that it has been difficult to accomplish that which would be desirable in an education program. Prescott said, we need an education program about this, and Arthur White says, well, you know, it's been tough. The A. Delafield says, if the truth were really known, a survey of Adventists would probably reveal that many of our people cling to the idea of inerrancy as far as Ellen White and the Bible prophets are concerned. That is, verbal inerrancy. And even our friend uh, Mer Merlin Bird in the uh, Ellen White Encyclopedia he said, the situation in the church regarding Ellen White's prophetic gift has been even more problematic. Various private compilations too often present a functional verbalism. Where's that word functional? A functional verbalism, confused hermeneutics and the subordinated scripture to Ellen White's writings. Now, I'm going to go back to the 1919 Bible Conference where these things were discussed. And somebody was saying in 1919 that we ought to educate the church. And uh, William Worth was there. He was later taught Bible at the uh, L.A. campus of CME. I couldn't find a picture of William Worth. So I went to Forest Lawn, and sure enough, I found this great. But his, wife is, his wife is married. Oh, I wanted you to see. Okay, so here's what Worth said when that suggestion was made we ought to educate the church. He said... Our students are being sent out with the idea that the testimonies are verbally inspired. And woe be to the man out where I am that does not line up with that. So, the 20s, chief among the evidences of the divine origin of the Bible is its infallible accuracy and precision. Now, you know, if you press these people, they would probably say, well, I don't mean there's no errors of any kind, but this is the kind of word that went out to the laity and why we have this uh, regi residual function. Uh, Carlisle Haynes, of course, was, was the leading evangelist of his day. Very effective and powerful evangelist and a thoughtful person. Um, but part of the dilemma we face, I guess, as a church is that our theology often is established by the evangelists <laughs> rather than scholars. Um, so sometimes the, the and that, that's not wrong, of course, but sometimes it's the simplified, easy to explain, lack of nuance approach that, that sets the pattern. And of course, that's caused some, some of our dilemma in, at the present time. Now, um, I don't show his face, but Alberto Tim, on, on, uh, 
YouTube has a presentation on inspiration. That's, that's the address. You can look it up when you see this on YouTube. Uh, and he mentions 1859 Lewis Galson's book, not one single error can be found in the more than 31,000 verses in the, spa, in the Bible. So here's Galson again, and this is the book that uh, Gil has. Let me just talk to you a little while about this book because it is a significant book. Um, Galson takes the approach to understanding inspiration is that it's verbally inspired because you can't differentiate words from thoughts. Thoughts are expressed in words. And Jesus based key arguments on words of the Old Testament. So the words are, are important. Galson um, didn't really go for mechanical dictation. He differentiated there. But he did believe in verbal inspiration. And did, did his book get uh, praised his, in Adventist publications or his, used? Yeah, his book was, was cited in the review as there were often uh, little ex extracts from his book in the review on plenary inspiration, on the reliability of scripture. So numerous times in the 1860s, his book was published, I think about 1859, and republished <coughs> later. What I discovered just recently in my research on Andrews is that in the year that Andrews died, he was encouraging his proofreader editorial assistant to extract <laughs> portions from Galson's book to publish in the Signs of the Times in, in Europe. So it was a standard book. But more than that, it came to be used as the textbook for most Adventist training classes for ministerial preparation. So people understood and knew Galson. When Prescott based his sermons in 1893 on it at the General Conference section, and he did a whole series of sermons on the plenary inspiration of Scripture, he was using Galson. But Galson had been established much no. earlier than that. Well, we, we must add that I think the White Estate actually has Clarence Christner's copy of Galson. And Christner, you know, was the main one who worked on the 1911 revision of the Great Controversy. And in Christner's copy, he's gone through and marked the places where he doesn't agree with Galson. And it's in the latter part of the book where Galson has quite a substantial discussion of verbal or thought inspiration. That was very much in the air that Adventists were breathing at the time. It wasn't just an Adventist discussion. It was a discussion beyond that. But here's another evidence that this problem goes much further. Stephen Haskell, 1910, argued that he had personally believed in verbal inspiration for 50 years. So in 1912, just after the Great Counterfeit to be has been re revised and, and Haskell was complaining about it, he wanted the old language. He didn't care if there was grammatical errors. He liked the texture of the grammatical errors, I guess. So anyway, Willie White writes to Haskell, I cannot see consistency in our putting forth a claim of verbal inspiration when Mother does not make any such claim. And I certainly think we will make a great mistake if we lay aside historical research and endeavor to settle historical questions by the use of Mother's books as an authority, when she herself does not wish them to be used in such a way. But by the verbalists or the inerrances, up to this day her books are used in that way. Yeah. What if you go back one? Robin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the important line that he didn't pop up is this one. Don't touch the screen. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I'm not making copies of this letter. This is just for you. And here's part of the problem. We can talk about these things amongst ourselves, quietly at Elmshaven, but don't tell the church folk. It would disturb them and perhaps diminish their confidence in the gift. And that, of course, is a problem, because we do not want to diminish confidence in the gift. The charisma that Elmite experienced, I believe, was genuine. You can't read the, the matters that she wrote without, I, I feel, without being moved 
by them. I see a genuine charisma here. But the discussion of what authority that charisma has is really the issue. And they didn't want to discuss it widely. Yeah, Elder Wilcox uh, was also in the view of the view that verbal inspiration was the historic teaching of the denomination. He had always taken that position himself, he said. Indeed, I hold to verbal inspiration of the Bible. I believe in thought inspiration as applied to both the Bible and the testimonies. Now, Gil, this is a little bit confusing. Well, yeah, I think... I he think, just yeah. contra tra contradicted himself, yeah. did he not? But I, I think Wilcox was aware that you can't really make a hard and fast distinction between words and thoughts. That they do blur together. And before and we're done this morning, we are going to show you a new view of verbal inspiration. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. E. Torrell Seek uh, taught uh, religion here at, at Loma Linda. In his syllabus, under the topic of verbal inspiration, no mistakes have ever been proved as originally given. Whatever that means. Um, the Holy Ghost lays stress on words and tense. The, the autographs. Yeah, the autographs probably, are, yeah. are infallible and yeah, inerrant. Yeah. See, the problem with Adventists, if we were fundamentalists and we only had the Bible, we could say, well, the autographs are perfect. But with Ellen White, we have the autographs. So we're not, we're not free to say that. Um, if the Bible is not verbally inspired, then who is to say which part is, is and which part is not? So that was taught to our medical students. Doctors, here. dentists, pastors, that's how the church came to understand it. Now, if you want to uh, get away from inerrancy, but only a slight sidestep, this is what you'll say. In inspired writings, ancient and modern, there are inconsequential <coughs> errors in minor insignificant detail. Now, we won't mention any of those, but we'll concede that. Judd Lake has written this book, Ellen White Under Fire. And very, very recent. This is a 2016 publication. Yeah, and, and he has a, 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 a sort of a list of the different positions on Ellen White. And uh, the official view of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that while, according to him, is that while Ellen White's writings are free from major <coughs> error, they do not contain minor discrepancies. They do contain minor discrepancies. So I wrote to him, I said, I said, Judd, uh, a discrepancy is not an error. It just means there's two sources here and they're not the same. And he wrote back and he said, well, I could have said error. So I'll put that in there. <laughs> That's really what he meant by discrepancy, but the culture doesn't allow us to say it. Yeah. That, that's out of the problem. So then, but he went on to say, so I, so I asked him, I said, well, now, have you ever in a published book pointed to an error in an inspired, inspired writing? No. He had, do you ever mention it in your lectures? Well, I mentioned it in my classes. Um, but, he said, not in doctrinal matters. So he was willing to concede some errors in uh, minor discrepancies in history, but not in doctrinal matters. So I'm not sure what he would do with that early Ellen White statement where she's writing to her little boy, and she said, wicked children God does not love. Uh, I, I think she grew out of that, but uh, I, I don't find that to be very good theology. Now, in the late 70s, all this was swirling around, and I became aware that the White Estate had the manuscript for the Huss and Jerome chapter of the Great Controversy. And I mentioned it to Don McAdams, and he went to Arthur White and got Arthur White's permission to study that manuscript, and he came up with this paper, Ellen G. White and the Protestant Historians. It would be 30 years before that paper was released, but it's now online, together with what wasn't in his original manuscript, and that is all of the, all of the, te uh, all of the pages of the manuscript itself. So it's online now. You can look it up on e.g. Uh, ellenwhite.org. But anyway, this paper mentioned several, about a dozen, discrepancies, errors, in Mrs. White's treatment of uh, this chapter of the history of Huss and Jerome. And it showed that she's relying page after page on Wiley's history. 
<clears throat> well, we cut off the top of Huss's head. Actually, I think they burned him at the stake rather than decapitating him. <laughs> That's his chapel, the Bethlehem Chapel. Uh, it's been reconstructed. Well, in the great controversy, Ellen White said, the Pope proceeded to the trial and, and condemnation of Huss and then declared the city of Prague to be under interdict. Well, McAdams said, no, it wasn't the Pope. It was the Archbishop, <coughs> the local Archbishop who declared the city of Prague to be under interdict. So Bob Olson looked at that. And you know, he had a reputation of being a staunch conservative. But this is what he said. Since present day historians have access to 15th century records that Wiley knew nothing about, they were able to give us an even more precise, be more precise than Wiley was in giving us the details of the Czechoslovakian reform. We are now told that it was not the Pope, as Wiley and Ellen White stated, but the Archbishop who put the city of Prague under interdict. So, you know, even conservatives can say, if, if she was wrong about that, no matter. You know, let's go on. But he also wrote a paper, a much longer paper. I think it's by him, because I can't see my hand in it, and, <clears throat> and I can't see Arthur White's hand in it. And that paper fell into the hands of Gerhard Hazel. And Gerhard Hazel wrote a paper <laughs> In response to that paper, which uh, has been described as an exercise in, uh, let me see, it was a big word, um, an exercise in uh, supercilious obscurantism. Yes. That's a big word. Uh, I, I had to look it up. <laughs> and actually, the one I, I'm the one. You created that, it. I'm the one that coined it because it, I just love big words. So anyway. Uh, Anyway, so he, uh, Hazel created this paper, which really went to task, went, went, went to work on the White Estate paper. And Hazel's position is maintained by his son, Michael, uh, who's a teacher at Southern Adventist University. And Michael relies on his father's paper, the one that attacked Bob Olson, for an article in the Ellen White Encyclopedia under Historians Ellen White's Use of where they say it is not at all certain that Spinka, that's the modern historian, would view his statement that Zinnick put Prague under interdict to be a contradiction to the Pope's involvement in the process that culminated in the interdict. And they cite an old work and a new work of Spinka to, to, to support that. Well, I'll tell you, uh, Russell Standish took after me on this, because I wrote a paper called uh, Historical Difficulties in the Great Controversy. He has a whole chapter in his book, the greatest, cut off the top of it, the greatest of all the prophets. And he really means it. He means that Ellen White was a greater prophet than Daniel, Jeremiah, John the Revelator, because she wrote more than any of them did, on more topics than any of them did. So she has to be the greatest. So here's what he said about this <coughs> alleged error. Clearly, the interdict, well, announced by the Archbishop of Prague, had been initiated by Pope Alexander V. Now, this is, I'm, I'm going to show you a statement. If I were writing Civil War history, and I said this, Abraham Lincoln laid the city of Vicksburg under siege and starved its inhabitants into submission. And you're a proofreader, a little bit precise. So that's what happens. Now I want to introduce you to Gerhard Hazel, what I call new view of verbal inspiration. He quotes Ellen White several years. The Holy Spirit plays a distinct role in writing down the thought inspiration. Ellen White stated, I am as dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord in writing my views as I am in receiving them. Of her public speaking, Ellen White says, it is not I who controls my words, and actions at such times. The Holy Spirit is guiding the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. When I am puzzled for a fit word to express my thoughts, he brings it clearly and distinctly to my mind. So, thus 
the Holy Spirit safeguards the transfer process from the inspiration of thoughts to the writing it down accurately. And then Hazel adds, this is not verbal inspiration in the old sense. And I add, it is verbal inspiration in the new sense. So, how do you handle alleged errors if you're a functioning fundamentalist and want to defend inerrancy? Well, there, there are a number of strategies. Uh, and inerrancists do not mention alleged errors. That, that's, the, that's the devil's work. They engage in argument to prove the statement is correct. They assume that when they get to heaven, they will discover that it's not an error at all. I think they'll be disappointed because Jesus will say, of course it was an error. I wanted it in there so you guys could have something to argue about. <laughs> they asserted that further research will resolve the apparent error, or they allege that the evidence that would prove it's not an error has been destroyed. Yeah, has been destroyed. Well, if you take these positions, you don't have to admit any errors anywhere. Now, Alden Thompson, in 1991, wrote a book. And by the way, this is a screenshot from uh, YouTube. He's on YouTube right now in a recent interview about his, his new version of this book. And so this is what Alden Thompson looks like today after all the gray hairs he acquired from the attacks on him. Um, so anyway, and that, that's on YouTube, it, on there, just search for inspiration by Alden Thompson. He was immediately met by this book, Issues in uh, Revelation Inspiration, 1992. And as you look at the chapter titles, you see that almost every chapter is a criticism of Alden Thompson for the positions that he took in his book. Alden was a, Alden's was a very pastoral book. He was concerned about students who were encounter, encountering these problems and didn't know how to cope with them. So he advanced a view of inspiration that would allow them to uh, relate to these problems. Well, in, uh, oh, I wish I had the whole picture here. Samuel Pippin is quoted in that, in that book, and this is what he says. Bible-believing scholars i.e. not Alden Thompson, Bible-believing <laughs> scholars accept every historical detail, chronology, numbers, events, and people as matters of faith and practice. Well, what was his, wasn't he a leader of the youth movement? And uh, so, still today, this is being taught to our, to our young people. Um, now, here's an interesting one. Um, uh, Berlin. Merlin Burke, in the SDA Encyclopedia, said he, he has a big bibliography, very valuable piece in that encyclopedia. Ellen White's opponents, we're running over, we'll hurry up. Ellen White's opponents, number one, hold to a more verbal view of inspiration and typically do not allow for the prophetic messenger to grow in his or her understanding of God's revelation over time. Now, what problem do you see with this statement, Gail? It's not just his opponents, <laughs> but the defenders, huh? It is the supporters, those who believe. Yeah, so Alden Thompson can be criticized for advocating degrees of inspiration because he talks about how Ellen White grew from fear to joy. And uh, if you're not going to allow for any growth, then you can't have that. Well, fundamentalism or inerrancy still survives Francis Schaeffer wrote, I hope I get it all here, the Bible is objective, absolute truth in all areas it touches upon. So let's conclude here. So let me try and draw some strings together here. Inspiration is a word that has a lot of baggage attached to it that is increasingly unhelpful. What we want to affirm in, in, in Scripture itself wants to affirm in the Word that it is God-breathed. We hear the voice of God in it. It speaks to us. It's life-giving. That's what God-breathed means. It's the life-giving <coughs> Word. And we hear that, that life-giving impulse in Scripture and in Ellen White, actually. But does that mean 
that every detail is absolutely correct. What happened for Prescott was that he believed that 1883 statement that you can change the words but you can't change the thoughts until he was asked to submit a list of corrections that changed the thoughts in great controversy. Just by putting one word alone in before the word Rome changed the thought of a sentence. And he had to wrestle with that. It caused him deep spiritual problems. So how do we affirm the life-giving word and hear the voice of God in Scripture and in Elamite, but still see the messiness of it? I was just enjoying listening to uh, Isaacson's book on Leonardo da Vinci this last couple of weeks. If you get the chance to read it or listen to it, it's a powerful story. Any medical person who's interested in anatomy, this guy drew pictures of anatomy by the hundreds. A very inquisitive person. And he's most known for this famous picture, the Mona Lisa. What makes this picture distinctive, the transformed art, changed art, provided artists with skills beyond, is the idea of sfumato. Have you heard that word before? S -f -m -f -f -s -f -m -a -t -o, something like that. It's an Italian word, because he wrote in Italian. Smato. He believed that you cannot capture reality by drawing hard lines around anything. When you get up close to something, it becomes vague, it becomes fuzzy, it becomes unable to be defined sfumato. Yeah, thank you. A very famous technique. The edge of the eyes, the edge of the mouth. When you get to the boundaries, lines don't work like the edge of a cloud. How do you tell where the edge of a cloud is? And I believe that that's true of the intersection of the divine with the human when it comes to the work of Scripture and Ellen White. That when you, you, when you try and draw lines like the pioneers did and say, well, we believe in degrees of inspiration, and here are four lines, four different degrees, it's inadequate. It doesn't work. And maybe even the line between words and thoughts doesn't work when you experience the work of God through humans as they communicate the voice of God to us. So Leonardo da Vinci might have some wisdom for us as we try and, and wrestle with this problem of what does inspiration mean? Time for questions. Not so much a question, but thank you for another fantastic presentation, as always, from both of you. I just wanted to share the observation, uh, the opportunity to be uh, in Walla Walla a couple of years ago when Alton Thompson was signing copies of the republication of his book, Inspiration. And there at the ABC were copies of his three or four or five books. And he had a stack of copies of issues in Revelation Inspiration, the critique of his book. And I said, what's... What's that doing here? And he says, I, th it's, I think it's only fair that people have an opportunity to hear my arguments and hear my critics and weigh them for themselves. That, I think, says something about his character. Just to come back to uh, our friend that we started with, <laughs> um, Dr. Miller. What Dr. Miller was saying about not being fundamentalist, you know, whether we were or not, <laughs> ultimately, I don't think is, is that critical. We cannot afford to be um, today when we confront the complexity of knowledge that we now have to process and cope with. So we agree on, on that um, perspective. And, and to be able to show that Adventists have moved, have struggled with the issue, have, have worked through an understanding, and the pendulum has swung backwards and forwards, um, helps us to understand that, that it's a an ongoing process that we have many things to learn and many, many things to unlearn.
two comments, if I may. One, I think you've demonstrated that all the way back, there has, there has been more than one view of this matter, and that there hasn't been an over, excuse me, overwhelming comprehensive consensus. That's, that's my impression. Secondly, as I've tried to think about this matter of inspiration, I have thought of the work of great scientists and artists uh, who will work on some endeavor for years and years and years, and then when they have a breakthrough, they will say something like this, it came to me. Scientists often say that, it came to me. Or artists often say that, it came to me. And I think that that's the human experience of inspiration. And I'm very doubtful that we can draw a sharp line between the way a scientist says, or an artist says, it came to me, and the way a prophet would say, it came to me. It seems to me to be very similar. The difference being the function or the purpose. Not the, not the manner, but the prophet has a particular purpose and the artist has a particular purpose. But in both cases, there's ex this experience. It came to me as though the best insight after years and years and years of labor was come, came to that person from outside. Thanks, Dave. That's a, a really um, profound insight, I think, because when we look at the work of Ellen White herself, that concept also happened with, with her. There were times when what came to her came clearly through a dream or through a paranormal experience of a vision. But there were other times when what came to her came as she was reading Wiley. And uh, McAdams has demonstrated this very clearly, that she was reading Wiley, making notes, even saying in her own manuscript, insert page 45 from Wiley into this section. So the coming to her, the insight, the, the meaning of history, the big picture, came as an aha as she was reading. As I have read letters that she wrote in the 1890s to the people in Battle Creek, I think there were times when, when what came to her came to her as an aha, as she was on the threshold between sleep and non-sleep, worrying about the deteriorating situation in Battle Creek. Sometimes it was a clear dream. There were other times when it was a worrying about this, worrying about that, and then, aha, that's what the solution is, and getting up and writing it. Ellen White was also collegial in her writing. Um, she relied on the circle around her, and sometimes the aha or the coming to her came through the secretary or the editorial assistant who decided to put the paragraphs in this particular order in order to make a strong argument, not a weak one. And Ellen White was happy to live with that and to work with it. So the way inspiration works, um, as Arthur White suggested, we need to come to a factual understanding of it. And I think one of the points that uh, Dr. Miller makes in his article in the Oxford Handbook is really helpful. While fundamentalists and other evangelicals in the late 19th century and in the 20th century were wrestling with the theory of how inspiration works, Adventists were confronted with the fact that they believed they had the phenomenon in their midst. And I believe that's true. He makes the point that we learn from observing the phenomenon in our midst. And the phenomenon is not defined by hard lines. <laughs> that this is divine, this is human. God works in a way that is messy because he has to work with humans. And there is no other alternative. Thank you for your uh, well-documented presentation. Uh, listening to your presentation, I was thinking, I want to present two things. I was thinking uh, in what measure postmodernism may influence our thinking, Adventist thinking about the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, how to read the Bible. And uh, I will mention a few, a few things that postmodernists believe in. Uh, number one, that there are no facts, just uh, interpretations. 
Number two, there is no real knowledge, it's just a construct. Therefore, it can be deconstructed. Number three, there is, uh, when we discover a text, it's just leading to other texts. And the final will be that the uh, wall is just a cultural memory. Number two thing that I, I want to uh, talk about is uh, a very interesting example in the Bible of inspiration. And maybe it will help us a little bit to elucidate this problem. Uh, the interesting fact that I'm referring to is the Pentecost. At the Pentecost, we have people speaking in a lot of different, the disciples, uneducated people, speaking in different languages. And they're thinking, how that could happen? Was the Holy Spirit implanting the whole vocabulary of one language in the mind of the person? Or the disciples were speaking in Hebrew or Greek, and the Holy Spirit was translating what they were saying into their own language. What do you think about this? Interesting, interesting options. In other words, the Holy Spirit served as one of these simultaneous translators for each person in the audience. It, yeah, there's no way of knowing, but that's the way it, it, it came out. And, and we know, too, that there's a difference between revelation and inspiration. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it suited the purposes of, of, of God uh, that Paul should record in the Bible that he wants somebody to send him his coat. Now, I don't think he had to have a vision to figure out he needed his coat. So it wasn't revealed, but it was in the Bible because it suits the purposes of God. And I somehow think that these problems in the Bible, these discrepancies, these errors, if you like, that suits the purposes of God, too. I believe the Bible is fully and inerrantly inspired. And there are such a thing as an, uh, an inspired error. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so how does one make this distinction between you know, the theology, the belief, it's sketched in doctrinal form, and the actual practice of it? All right? and the disconnect that one oftentimes sees. Because New Testament scholars have to wrestle with this because E.P. Sanders made the case that uh, Judaism was a religion of, of grace and mercy, and yet when we read through the Gospels, it looks like perhaps the Pharisees misinterpreted it and got a bit legalistic. So there's the theology, there's the theory, and then the practice. Uh, does that exist among us as well? I, I think it must, and, and you know, uh it's always, uh, even these people who are speaking quite assuredly about this thing, you can see that there's, it's not entirely clear what they meant. So we just need to keep uh, humble and keep educating our, our, our members and our students. And um, there, is, there, is a, there is a danger on both sides. There's a danger if you take a very rigid, inerrant, inerrantist view and then you encounter these problems, you will lose everything. You think of, um, who's our friend, uh, uh, is it Ryan Bell? Uh, Ryan Bell goes to Weimar. You can see he's uh, is too liberal. He goes to Weimar to get his education. And he interns under Doug Batchelor, you see? And then later in life, he sees all these problems. And starting out with this rigid construct of inspiration, he throws it all out, and now he's an evangelist just as sincere and just as animated for atheism as he was to begin with. And uh, you see Kenwright, you know, giving these very strict views, and he lost his way too. But of course, there's others who move more and more and start down that slippery slope and lose their faith on that side too. I've hiked a lot of slippery slopes on the Pacific Crest Trail. And I found that if I stay on the straight and narrow path, I won't slip off. I, if I can just shout an answer, perhaps. I think the point you raise is, is a helpful one. We, we face dangers when we, we, when we try and impose a theoretical structure or a systematic theological perspective on top of the, the phenomenon and the data. And our theoretical perspectives, while we, 
wrestle with them and they're helpful in our understanding, they're always inadequate. And I'm not sure that it's always postmodern, because Leonardo da Vinci wasn't postmodern. But he recognized that when we come to the boundaries of things, we need to step back and say, there's more complexity in here and have an attitude of awe and wonder and listen to the voice, the, the spirit that speaks to spirit. Uh, for me, that's, that's the, the secret to listening to scripture. He that shall do his will shall know of the doctrine, said Jesus. So if there's a willingness to respond to the spirit, whether the spirit speaks in the small way or the big way, you know, we need to have a heart to listen. I'm, I'm trying to sort through and understand the gravitas of any errors that uh, you folk have noted in uh, your research. It's very easy for me as a writer to accept the messiness uh, of writing and, com uh, and compiling, um, but I draw the line on a clear intention to deceive. Have you got any examples of uh, errors where there's an intention to deceive? That, that is very hard uh, ever to establish. Um, you know, Ellen White backdated a vision. But we don't know what was in her mind. We don't know what, why she did it or what she was thinking or how she understood what she was doing. So getting to the intention to deceive is, 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 is very difficult. And then we look at the whole tenor of the person's life and say, we don't think, we don't think she did. But uh, yeah, it, it, uh, there, there, are, there is this question of uh, uh, intention to deceive. I'm sure Mrs. White didn't mean to, mean to deceive us about whether it was the Pope or the Archbishop that imposed the interdict. Mm -hmm. Deceit has taken place, that's clearly. Prescott's concern. There was, it was deceptive, the way the church had been educated. But intentional, he said unintentional <laughs> in his letter. Um, what he meant by that, I think, was that there was a good purpose in not speaking openly because they wanted to affirm the authority. And any diminution of the authority by acknowledging a weakness or a mistake was, was problematic. Um, but there was a, a cover-up, but not intentional. Or if it was intentional, it was done with a good purpose. Willie White, in writing to Froome in 1939, explaining how Ellen White was reliant on, on writers and, and that she had many books in the library and that she was a fast reader and that she had a retentive memory, he says to Froome at the end of his letter, but don't, this is not to go beyond, just you and I. Well, you can only do that for so long. This will be our last question here. Um, I really appreciated what you said about both the Bible and Ellen White's writings being life-giving. Um, and I feel like, maybe just to speak from the younger generation, like I grew up in mainstream Adventist, the Adventist educational system. And I often heard criticisms of Ellen White's writings, and I never, uh, I never read her. And I heard things that she had written that were wrong, um, things that had been perceived the wrong way. And because of that, I feel like I really missed out on the blessing of the storyline. Um, and it wasn't until my early 20s when I started actually reading her, reading The Great Controversy, uh, going on a great controversy tour and going to where Huss and Jerome um, were martyred and all these things that I really started to see, wow, like the Protestant Reformation was beautiful. It was people, you know, people putting their lives at risk to fight against force and, and hatred and to fight against a system. And so I felt like I had been really gypped in not um, getting the blessing of the meat of what it was that the, the weight of her message was speaking to because I had um, just heard a lot of things from people who maybe had never known how to read her. Um, and I say all this, you know, having a thought inspiration perspective, but I guess my question is, 
Um, and, and I think that applied too. I felt gypped when I was reading what she wrote about families and relationships and health and just realizing, wow, if I had known this stuff, my life would have been better or my family would have been happier. So I have a lot of friends on this campus that are young people that have never read Ellen White um, that don't know the storyline and don't know the beauty and the meaning behind things. And I guess my question is, um, what responsibility do we have simultaneously to just encourage people to read Ellen White, to encourage people to not miss out on the profound blessing that she is? And how can we kind of balance that tension between you know, communicating um, potential inaccuracies uh, without maybe um, eroding young people's um, value of, of the message in general. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very important. And, and you could see in this criticism of Walden Thompson's book that the, the, those who are criticizing him are constantly saying, you know, Alden, you, you, you told us about all these problems, but you didn't uh, emphasize the divine side of the thing and the, and the real resources that are here. And so that, 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 that is a, a challenge too. You know, as, a, as historians, we're always delighted to find that, the, uh, that they were wrong in the past, you know. I discovered that Arthur White, my boss, had celebrated his birthday on the wrong day all of his life. And uh, I found his letter, you know, and I proved it to him. He was not happy about that <laughs> until he turned 65 and needed to prove he was eligible for Social Security. Then he came to me and said, where's my dad's letter? I need to take it for Social Security. <laughs> so yes, we, 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 we do need to um, share the, the joy and the discovery and the, and the uh, nourishment that can come from uh, studying and, and, and reading these things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ron and Gil, thank you so much. <laughs> they will be here for a grilling afterwards. <laughs> uh, next week we're going to have Dr. Fritz Guy who uh, will be speaking to us. Uh, so at this time we'll have our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Uh -huh.